So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you might be connecting. My name is Marion Wentworth, and I'm President and CEO of Management Sciences for Health. For those of you who are unfamiliar with MSH, we are a global health nonprofit focused on making foundational changes to the healthcare system. Our philosophy is not to replace or run parallel systems, but rather to collaborate with our partners to strengthen existing systems and complement them where we can. Thank you for taking the time to participate in this first event in this series of interactive real-time virtual roundtable discussions on the theme of locally leading the way. The discussions will explore innovations, examine data, and provide real life examples of health system strengthening activities that are both highly urgent for responding to the current COVID-19 pandemic, and also important for laying the groundwork for more stable, responsive healthcare. Also, a big thank you to our co-host, Deloitte Consulting, and our panelists who are experts in health supply chain management, pharmaceutical services, and health technologies. You will meet them very soon. Our work ranges from publishing the Managing Drug Supply Book and International Medicine Pricing Guide to launching innovative last mile and patient-centric approaches and technologies, including private drug seller initiatives in Africa, such as MedSource and Addos. We also help dozens of countries institute systems that make sure that quality medicines are available, affordable, safe, and appropriately used. As COVID-19 strains healthcare across the world, particularly in low resource settings, the need for well-functioning pharmaceutical systems has never been so clear nor so urgent. To prevent and contain this pandemic, countries will need to have information systems that allow them to track the important medical technologies and pharmaceuticals. And a control tower is an example of a helpful solution there. There's also a need to strengthen policy, legislative and regulatory environment to ensure easy introduction of novel vaccines and technologies, and also off-label use of existing medicines. There need for supply chains that will guarantee products get to the health workers and patients who need them, where they need them, and when they need them. We need adequate systems in place to guarantee that these commodities will be used rationally and that they do not cause harm to patients nor populations. What then can countries do right now to strengthen their pharmaceutical systems in an anticipation of COVID vaccine and novel therapies? How can they do so with limited resources and competing priorities? These are hard questions, but to me, this moment is an opportunity to bring more people into our work in pharmaceutical systems and to focus not just on supply chains that bring the product, but on systems to ensure appropriate use and patient safety. It's a time to make new allies and to develop new ways of working with multinational corporations, with local private sector, and with local leaders, governmental and otherwise. This is another opportunity to capitalize on the rich local expertise that provides the foundation for our collective efforts to create solutions that are appropriate for their contexts and can be carried out locally long after donors have left. I truly believe that only through diverse voices will there be true innovation. And boy, is there a time when, is this a time when true innovation is needed? I'm looking forward to your insights and engagement. This work is critical and you are part of the solution. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our moderator, Wade Warren. Wade Warren is the Chief Strategy Officer for International Development at Deloitte Consulting. And in this role, he leads strategic insight, provides thought leadership, and brings innovative technology solutions to U.S. foreign assistance and international development clients. A globally recognized leader in international development, he previously served as the acting administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. During 27 years with USAID, Wade served in a broad range of senior management positions in the bureaus for policy planning and learning, for global health, and Africa. Additionally, he was acting chief operating officer of the State Department's Office of the Director of U.S. Foreign Assistance. Wade also served at USAID missions in Zimbabwe and Botswana. He received his undergraduate degree in international business from the Thun 
I'm sorry, from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and his graduate degree in international business from the Thunderbird School of Global Management. Earlier in his career, he worked as an analyst and a speechwriter in the US House of Representatives. Over to you, Wade. Thanks, Marianne. I always, uh, when I when I hear somebody read out that I was at USA for 27 years, I feel uh, much, I sound much older than I feel, but uh, I'm, uh, I appreciate that introduction. And I'm really glad uh, to be able to, to moderate this panel. I, I welcome you all. Um, I, uh, as Marian uh, noted, this webinar is the first in a series that's designed to showcase how partnerships and innovation can minimize the impacts of COVID-19 on, on public health and, and try to strengthen uh, health systems so that uh, the, the lives and economies around the world that have been disrupted can be, can be put back in order. Um, and, and in today's panel, as, as Marian noted, is, is specifically focused on pharmaceutical supply chains. Um, we, we all have seen how COVID-19 has heightened the need for pharmaceutical supply uh, strengthening in lower and middle income countries. Um, these countries, like everyone else, are, are grappling with the demands for vaccines and treatment and diagnostics and personal protective equipment, but there are lots of chain challenges, as we know, uh, in ensuring access to safe effective and affordable uh, medical products in, in these countries. So during this webinar, we're going to discuss how the global community and lower and middle income countries can take advantage of the COVID-19 opportunity to strengthen pharmaceutical systems and supply chains. Um, and and in, in my view, that goes beyond a narrow focus on avoiding stockouts and, and looks at more broadly how we can incorporate new approaches uh, that that recognize that the supply chain interacts with the whole uh, broader health system. So I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing from our panelists, and and I'm I'm delighted to be uh, in a position to moderate this panel. Um, speaking of the panelists, we have an all-star lineup uh, of five panelists for uh, today's events. I'm, I'll mention them just quickly in the perspective that they bring, and then I'll and give you a little information about each one of them. So we have John Nkangasong, who's the head of Africa CDC. We have Moji Sola Christiana Adeyeye, who is represents the perspective of a regulator. We have Bildar Bugama. Uh, Baguma, who runs a, a central medical store, and then we have two supply chain experts from the organizers of this event. We have Rick uh, van der Vecti from Deloitte Consulting and Kofi Abouagye Nyame from MSH. Um, so let me let me tell you just a little bit about each of these folks uh, so that when, when you hear from them, you'll have a bit of their background. Uh, John in Kangasong, as I mentioned, is the director of Africa CDC. He's the first director of uh, the C Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He was appointed in 2016. He is a leading virologist with nearly 30 years of work experience in public health. Before his appointment with Africa CDC, he worked for US CDC, where he was uh, chief of the International Laboratory Branch at the Division of Global HIV AIDS. Before that, he worked as a virologist uh, for the World Health Organization, and he has more than 120 publications focusing particularly on HIV diagnostics, pathogenesis, and drug resistance. So, John, you're you're welcome. Um, Lojisola uh, Adeyeye is the Director General of Nigeria's National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, known as, known as NAFDAC. Um, as, as the head of NAFDAC, she is Nigeria's leading voice on the regulation of food and pharmaceuticals. Since taking the helm of NAFDAC, she has focused on quality management and she's brought NAFDAC from insolvency to solvency. She has refocused the agency to be driven by standard operating procedures and has embraced international standards and best practices. Moji is a fellow of the Nigeria Academy of Science and the Nigeria Academy of Pharmacy. She is an uh, academic research fellow of the American Association of Colleges and Pharmacy, and she's the first African woman fellow of the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists. She's an expert in research and drug development. She has five patents and 65 peer-reviewed manuscripts, book chapters, and books. So you're welcome, Moji. Um, Bildard Baguma is the executive director of the Uganda Joint Medical Store. So Bill, Bill Dard is a, is a public health professional, a management specialist, an HR practitioner, 
an educator and a philanthropist. He has done work, uh, public health work and humanitarian work with the Ugandan Red Cross Society. He's done clinical work with the uh, Mulaga, Mulago National Referral Hospital in Kampala, which is the largest public hospital in Uganda. He's a public health advocate with the Agency for Cooperation in, in, in International Health, and he's a member of the Ugandan National Drug Authority. So, Bill Dart, you're certainly welcome. Uh, next, we have my colleague, uh, Rick van der uh, with Deloitte Consulting. He's a senior manager in the supply chain network operations. Uh, he manages a team of specialists who focus in particular on establishing operational control towers. And I know the concept of a control tower may be new to some of our listeners, so we'll give uh, Rick a chance to explain what control towers are and how they work. He applies a concept of exception-based management uh, to the challenges of supply chains, and he'll, he'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, and, and then most recently, uh, he has been working uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic on uh, ventilator manufacturing supply chains uh, and using control towers to ensure, ensure smooth supply from the raw material suppliers all the way to the care providers. So we look forward to hearing uh, more from him on that. And then last uh, but not least, my, my colleague Kofi Anyame, who is the program director for the USAID funded program called Medicines, Technologies and Pharmace Pharmaceutical Systems or MTAPS. Uh, and as the, as the director of MTAPS, Kofi uh, provides strategic vision and leadership to uh, a $169 million program. He collaborates closely with USAID, country governments, implementing agencies and, and partners on pharmaceutical system strengthening activities. He's a, a real thought leader in pharmaceutical management with more than 25 years of experience. And he has held senior management positions in the past with other USAID funded supply chain programs, including of particular relevance uh, to this panel, the Strengthening Pharmaceutical Systems Program. Before he came to MSH, Kofi worked uh, for 10 years in Ghana's Ministry of Health, uh, where he served as the deputy program manager of the Ghana National Drugs Program. And he's also a fellow of the West Africa Postgraduate College of Pharmacists and the Ghana College of Pharmacists. So as I mentioned, we've got a real uh, blue ribbon panel here of experts, uh, and I know you'll all uh, enjoy hearing what they have to say. Before I turn to an initial round of questions for the, for the panelists, I wanted to go over just two uh, logistical matters one is at the end of the webinar, we're going to be taking questions from you, from the audience. So please feel free at any time uh, as our panelists are speaking. If a question occurs to you, uh, enter it into the chat box. We'll be assembling the questions that we receive through the chat box, and then we'll get to as many of them as we can during the audience question and answer portion of the of the uh, event. So, so please do take advantage of that of that function. And then secondly, we are going to uh, offer three polls uh, during the course of the webinar to, to gauge uh, your views as an audience on some broad questions uh, related to pharmaceutical supply chains. And we'd like to start with the first one now. So if, uh, if the um, organizers can put the poll in place there, you should be able to see it. And I will uh, I will read it uh, to you and, and please uh, take a moment to think about the question and, and provide your answers. So the first poll says that the global medical supply chain has come under focus with COVID-19, but will this visibility lead to significant and lasting improvements? So we're asking you, uh, will the post-COVID-19 global health pharmaceutical system and supply chain see A, robust but short-term improvements, B, new commitment and sustained improvement, or C, weaker performance? We thought this was a good question to, to get us uh, started just because it, it speaks to um, the overarching concern about the supply chain and the impact that COVID-19 has had on it. So we'll be interested in uh, the audience's views about whether improvements will be long lasting or, or whether the, the pandemic is actually harming uh, supply chains. So let me read the question through just once more and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, show the results. So the, the question is, post COVID-19 global health pharmaceutical systems and supply chains will see A, robust but short-term improvement, B, new commitment and sustained improvement, 
or C, weaker performance. And Mackenzie, I, I'll turn to you. If uh, can you tell if, if most people have voted now, and if so, we can uh, we can display the results. Okay, you should see. Uh, looks like uh, a small majority feels that. Uh, there will be new commitment and, and sustained improvements uh, to supply chain. So that's, that's certainly encouraging. Um, and, uh, and then uh, some feel that the, the, uh, the improvements will be robust, but short lived. And, and I'm glad to see that not many people think there will be permanent harm and weaker uh, performance uh, to the supply chain overall. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mackenzie. Um, all right, without further ado, uh, I'm going to uh, turn to uh, the panelists. I'm going to ask each of them a round of questions. Uh, we'll get a, a dialogue going, and then we'll have a, a second round of questions. Uh, and then, as I mentioned uh, at the end, we'll turn to audience questions. But let me start uh, first with you, John. I, I wanted to ask you, I, I know that the African Union has launched uh, this thing called the Africa Medical Supply supplies platform, the AMSP, in response to COVID-19. I imagine all of our listeners don't know uh, what it is, so I was hoping you could tell us briefly just what, what is the AMSP, and then I have two questions about it. One is, what have you seen as you've helped manage the AMSP? What has it demonstrated about how supply chains can adapt quickly in an emergency and, and where uh, regional and international cooperation is most important? And then what has it demonstrated about the collective power of African countries to ensure that uh, procurements are equitable and, um, and, and local? Good, uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. And greetings from Addis Ababa, the Africa CDC. Uh, I think, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be part of this, uh, to contribute to this discussion. First, uh, the African medical supply platform represents a significant innovation in, um, in public health emergency response for the continent. The, the birth of uh, the, the, the platform, the, AS, the AMSP, uh, is really tied to the challenge we face as a continent when COVID-19 hit and we were scrambling to secure diagnostics. At that time, we were told that uh, by a task force that had been put in place in Geneva that uh, after a period of about uh, two months, the continent was going to get access to 2.3 million tests and the continent of uh, 1.3 billion people. So that seem terribly insufficient for us. So we thought as a continent, we should regroup and figure out ways to make, uh, uh, to, uh, to search for the diagnostics ourselves. So the platform, uh, that was the, 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 the beginning of the platform. The second thing that is very important to note from the platform is the, the power of partnership, the ability for the, the public sector, private sector to come together to solve a common problem. And it's a great partnership between, and also leadership. This is uh, the whole need for that platform came as a result of uh, President Amaposa, uh, the president of South Africa in his uh, capacity as the chair of the African Union, uh, coordinating the, 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 the continental response with the chair of the, the AU uh, chairperson, Musa Faki. So I think that uh, they appointed an envoy, uh, an AU special envoy, Call Strive uh, Masiwa, who is um, a, a, a genius in in, in, in in telecom, and he pulled together a, 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 an amazing group of in, young engineers across the continent to establish uh, what I will call the Amazon.com for Africa, uh, in uh, the, uh, or the Alibaba if you are in China of, of China to to uh, resolve that problem. So it, it started off small from. Let's have a platform to coordinate our uh, supplies for diagnostics, then expanded to other commodities. And today, so many uh, 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 vendors are on that platform, and it has really helped to ease um, 
the the, the supply chain management issues and logistics for uh, our continent for the commodities that we needed to respond to COVID-19. So in sum, that platform represents uh, uh, innovation for the continent. It represents also partnership, the power of partnership, and it speaks to Africa's ability to do, do or demonstrate a can-do attitude. It says that Africa can come together and solve its own problem and, and diminish dependency on externalities. I think COVID-19 has shown us how vulnerable we are in three areas, uh, areas of diagnostics, areas of uh, uh, vaccines, access to vaccines as we uh, as the world raised to acquire vaccines and areas of uh, treatment, which are things that we hope uh, to discuss during this uh, very interesting roundtable on how Africa can actually diminish its dependence by building its own health systems uh, that include manufacturing. I think uh, health system strengthening without manufacturing, as we've learned from the COVID-19, is uh, not very useful uh, at this point. Thank you. Hey, thank you, John. Um, uh, ne next, we're going to turn to, to uh, Moji Sola out of Yeye. And, and Moji, uh, John mentioned um, manufacturing uh, pharmaceuticals, which I think uh, uh, very nicely to your role as as a regulator. And I wanted to ask you a, a two part question uh, about regulation. What, one is, what, you know, as in your role as, as the chief regulator for uh, food and, and drugs in, in Nigeria, what have you seen as, as the biggest challenges that you have faced uh, during COVID-19 in ensuring that, that medical products are safe and effective? And then and the second part, and I'll, I'll remind you with the with, uh, you reminding on the second part of the question is, have, have regulators been engaged in in preparations for rolling out a new vaccine uh, for the for the prevention of COVID nineteen and what and what should the role of regulators be in that? So so thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you. Moji, I'm I'm afraid we're having trouble uh, with your audio. Um, I don't know whether the organizers can can do something about that, or if we should should uh, go to a, the next panelist and come back to you. Can uh, if uh, Mackenzie and folks, if can you tell me if uh, if we should move on, or or if if this can be quick, quickly fixed? Let's move to the next panelist, and we'll come back. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, Moji, apologies for that. We'll we'll uh, see what we can do and, and come back to you uh, uh, shortly. So so let me turn next to uh, to Bill Dard, who who I mentioned is is responsible for the Uganda Joint Medical Store. So so Bill Dard, you are you are right on the front lines of of the COVID nineteen response. I, I wanted to ask you uh, what's been the secret to your success in maintaining adequate supplies and adequate service for the health commodities uh, to, to get to the patients uh, who need them during COVID-19. And um, I, I guess kind of in response to what we saw in the poll that we that we put on the screen uh, at the beginning of, of this round of questions, do, what do you think about the, the longer term impacts of COVID-19 on, on national procurement strategies? Or are, is there gonna be, um, uh, long-term benefits uh, to strengthen those those systems. The uh, for this um, um, for organizing this meeting, and I'm privileged to be part of this panel and this discussion this evening. If you allow me, I would like to first start by stating who Joint Medical Store is. Um, Joint Medical Store is a private not-for-profit uh, trustship, uh, which was established uh, 41 years ago as a faith-based institution and set up by the Uganda Protestant and Uganda uh, Catholic Medical Bureaus, which two bureaus um, account for approximately 40% of the health outcomes in Uganda through a network of more than 600 
health facilities across the country. And JMS is involved in um, procuring, warehousing, distribution, and to some extent also manufacturing of health supplies. And uh, we supply this to the faith-based uh, health facilities and also to the government and the private sector as well. Now, I wanted to raise like three key points that I think were crucial for us during this uh, COVID-19. Because uh, one of the key things that happened with COVID-19 was that uh, a lot of the supply chain, as we saw, it was disrupted because of increased demand, because of uh, uh, disruptions in the transport mechanisms. Now, what helped us to continue working was, number one, having long-term institution arrangements. Long-term institution arrangements, especially on two fronts. The first one was with the government of Uganda and the Ministry of Health. Because prior to the outbreak, we already had a memoranda of understanding, we already had arrangements, which arrangements could enable us to clear goods quickly and supply them quickly and expediting also the regulatory uh, clearance. This was uh, very crucial for us uh, to work during COVID. But also on the other hand was long-term institutional arrangements with suppliers that have been established over the last 40 years and that we could then leverage on to get the supplies that at times were in, in short supply. And I can give you a quick example because we uh, across the world, there was a shortage of critical care ventilators. But because we had a long-term established um, relationship with one of the suppliers, we were able to get these uh, critical care ventilators supply the Ministry of Health uh, during the COVID. The, the second key thing for me was leveraging technology. Because we have established systems that we can be able to have business-to-business -business capabilities with the uh, health facilities that we serve, that we are able to also provide last mile distribution for them was very crucial because movement was also limited during the period. And uh, the, the last point I want to mention is the East African pool procurement mechanism, which we established about three years ago and involves the uh, joint medical store and sister faith-based medical supply chain meds in Kenya, Bufuma in Rwanda. And through this, we are able to tap into major uh, suppliers and establish relationships which were useful for us during this COVID time. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you, Bill Dorn. Um, that, that's all. That's all quite interesting, and, and I, I, I hope you'll have more uh, a chance to say more about the the faith based uh, aspects of of the work that you do, because I think that's a, an area of supply chain that many of us don't uh, don't don't think about and know as much about as we should. Um, let, let me turn next to to uh, Rick. Uh, Rick, I, I mentioned at the outset that you have done uh, work on control towers uh, with Deloitte and specifically uh, related to, to ventilators during the COVID-19. But can you explain to uh, the audience what, what a control tower is, how how you use them in energy supply chains, what, what is meant by an exceptions-based management approach, uh, and then tell us more specifically about uh, the work that you've done on on with regard to ventilators. Uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. And, and hello, everyone. Um, first of all, th thank you so much for for organizing this and for for inviting me. Um, uh, just as an introduction to control towers, over the years that I have been working with Deloitte and in, in global supply chains, in pharmaceutical supply chains, medical device supply chains. Um, we started to realize uh, how many transactions there are in any given supply chain. A transaction can be a shipment, it can be a production order, it can be a quality sample. Uh, and and this, this drives the complexity in any supply chain. And what we are naturally taught from like, growing up as, as kids, we are taught to make lists. People are taught to make lists of everything that needs to do. But what happens when you make a list that is that long that you can't even see the beginning and the end of the list at the same time? Well, that is exactly exactly where we try to apply analytics, and that is the concept of control towers, analytics that takes that list and finds the exceptions that are truly important in that list. 
Having an action list of 10,000 items is not going to help anyone. But now with the computing power that's coming, uh, coming available, we can actually apply analytics to, to filter through the lists to identify the transactions that really matter. And as an example, we have worked in, in pharmaceutical supply chains where you have 10 million shipments on an annual basis. The visibility, pure visibility on 10 million shipments at any given time is not that interesting. If you have the visibility paired with an exception-based monitoring approach, which is not only technology, it's also a mindset for people to trust the system, uh, uh, to trust the system and from that system accept the true exceptions that the system identifies for you, and educate people to, to act as what we call event managers, people that are truly exception-based, uh, uh, working in an exception-based manner. Now, as an example, and to answer your question, Wade, um, when the pandemic started, uh, we saw the need for global visibility of the availability and production of ventilators. Ventilators was one of the items that was in the news. Everyone probably has heard or read about it. Um, uh, as one of the products that was essential in the hospitals for people uh, on the ICUs. Now, these ventilators were becoming available as the manufacturers were standing up their capacity very rapidly. But, but the problem was there was no visibility in when product became available, what the orders and the outstanding orders were, and what the needs were in the hospitals, and what were the needs at what given moment in time. So what we worked on is actually making that list. So back to my example of the list, we made a list um, by following an approach where we can, make, where we can uh, uh, combine all the information available in the network from the manufacturer, from the suppliers to the manufacturer, to the hospital systems combine that and identify the exceptions of where the product was, was really needed. And this is a what we call a true control tower platform that provides visibility, exceptions. In crisis time, everything is an exception, a prioritized exception list and action list. Great. Thank you, Rick. I, I appreciate that explanation. Um, turning uh, uh, next to, to Kofi. Um, Kofi, I wanted to ask you um, if you could just talk a little bit. I know you've had such a long uh, work experience working in pharmaceutical system strengthening. Can you talk a little bit about the role that pharmaceutical systems play during this pandemic? And, and what areas do you think COVID-19 has created a, a window of opportunity for countries to, to overhaul their pharmaceutical systems and make them make them stronger? Thanks, Wade, and uh, thanks, panelists, and thanks, participants, for joining this very, very important discussion. Yes, Wade, indeed, yes, pharmaceutical systems strengthening should play a role in this pandemic, but we really need to ask the question, is pharmaceutical system strengthening playing a role in this pandemic or getting us ready for all pandemics or for all crisis situations? We've been fighting this problem of access to essential medicines for the vulnerable population, the appropriate use, the prevalence of substandard and falsified medicines in our markets for a very, very long time with varying degrees of, of success. But you know what? COVID has actually served as a magnifying lens for us. It's a watershed moment that has brought out these existing problems in our countries. It, it's just really, really begging for a response. It has actually exposed the inherent weaknesses we all know that a third of the world's population lacks access to essential medicines. We all know that substandard products and falsified products are all over Africa. Indeed, about 19% 19, 19 of all commodities circulated are substandard. We all know that these medicines are not being prescribed appropriately. They are not being used appropriately. And the only way to ensure secure access to safe and effective quality assured affordable products in a sustainable manner in a crisis or a pandemic is having a, a strengthened pharmaceutical system. That is the only way we can ensure that the, all the elements, governance, human resources, information, financing, service delivery, including rational use, all these elements needs to be strengthened. So we really, really, really need to ensure that there is in place a system to regulate, to select, to procure, to distribute, to prescribe, and the governance aspects of it. How do you ensure quality? How do you ensure uh, uh, efficacy? How do you ensure patient safety? But you know what? There's an account proverb which translated says that we cannot 
We cannot be taking care of the ants, getting rid of the ants around us while standing in an ant. Essentially, we cannot be strengthening a system within a crisis. The system must be strong before the crisis happens. Without a functional system, countries cannot conduct drug and vaccine trials and reviews. We cannot expedite registration. We cannot quantify demand. We cannot secure funding and procure the, the, the volume that we need. New products will hit the market. Whether they are brand new novel products or repurposed products for COVID-19, government needs a way to monitor their use. We need a way to guard against adverse events. We need to, a way to ensure incorrect, to, to prevent incorrect prescribing and inappropriate use. So the systems need to be strong for us to be able to have an adequate response here. So the real question is that what areas have been highlighted? If you ask me all areas, we are learning a lot of things now. What is happening to us? Information or disinformation is all around us. What works? What doesn't work? What are the treatment outcomes? What are the side effects? Where are we going to get reliable data, reliable information about these aspects? Clinical trials. We all saw the issues around PPE production, PPE availability, distribution, market protections, distribution of ventilators. But if I would narrow it down, I'll talk about, about three areas. First is supply chain management. That is the entry point to the system. We need to have a system that allows us to to, to manage the unpredictable demand. We need to have regional collaborations. We need to have blanket purchase agreements. We heard one of the panelists talk about the established relationships. We need to make sure that we have an adaptive and a responsive procurement and transportation system, distribution system. We need to have a whole market approach, both the public and the private sector. The second important point for me is regulation and governance. Our um, medicines regulatory authorities are not that strong. We need appropriate governance structures to ensure that all aspects of the system are strengthened. And lastly, priority setting, health technology assessments, the use of all these tools needs to be heightened, needs to be highlighted to make sure that the systems are ready to mitigate, the systems are ready to face any crisis that we would face. I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kofi. I like the analogy of uh, trying to uh, deal with an ant bed while you're standing in an ant bed. Is, uh, I feel. I think we all feel like that's the situation that we're in uh, in these days. Um, I believe that the Moji is still having uh, connectivity problems, so I will come to her as soon as she's able to rejoin us. But I, I think uh, for the moment that will end our our first round of questions. Uh, and we were uh, two things, uh, one and two, we're receiving some questions in the chat box, uh, which is great. And we'll get to those in a moment. Please continue to put your questions in, in the chat box. Uh, and then secondly, we, I mentioned that we were going to have three polls. I'd, I'd like to go ahead and launch the, the second poll now. If um, we are in a position to do that. Okay, there, there we are. Okay, uh, this, this is a, just like the first one. If, uh, if you can take a few moments to, to uh, read through the responses and, and give us your ideas and then we'll uh, display the results immediately. So, so this question is, was the pharmaceutical system breakthrough evolving from the pandemic that's most likely to endure? So this would especially be for those of you who felt that there would be enduring improvements from the, from the pandemic. So choices are tapping the private sector for help, including the faith-based organizations, the idea of a control tower or a central crisis team to handle emergencies, global or regional coordinated bulk procurement, local manufacturing of essential products, or faster introduction of effective, affordable health technology. And we have touched on uh, some of these issues already in our remarks. Uh, we've talked about control towers, of course, and the role of faith-based organizations, uh, local procurement, um, and, and coordinated uh, procurement. So I think all of these are potential positive outcomes of, of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll, I'll read through once more. Uh, and then we can display the results. So the question is, what's the pharmaceutical system breakthrough evolving from the pandemic that's most likely to endure? A, tapping the private sector for help, including faith-based organizations. B, 
the idea of a control tower or central crisis team to handle emergencies. C, global or regional coordinated bulk procurement. D, local manufacturing of essential products. And E, faster introduction of effective, affordable health technologies. So, uh, Mackenzie, if we if you if we've gotten enough uh, responses, if we could draw the polling to a close and and show us the results. Interesting. People are are all uh, all all five options. Or there were uh, people who thought all five options would would be uh, enduring benefits from pharmaceutical supply chain strengthening as a result of this crisis, uh, but with uh, the largest uh, group saying that local manufacturing of essential products would be would uh, be an enduring outcome. So I think that's quite interesting, but it does, uh, it appears that the audience feels that at least uh, some of, of all of those options uh, will, will remain as positive outcomes from the, from the crisis. So uh, thank you, thank you for that. Um, let me turn now to a second round of questions. And again, we will, I'm hoping that um, that Moji will be able to rejoin us. But but let me start back uh, with you, Don. I, I wanted to ask about how Africa CDC is helping to ensure that Africa doesn't miss out on new diagnostics and vaccines or therapeutics and, or get insufficient quantities. I, I know that Africa CDC is is leading by example on global health uh, and cooperation. You talked about that in your first uh, response. Um, you're establishing multi-stakeholder mechanisms for engaging all of society. Uh, what has what have you learned? What's been demonstrated in terms of how this involvement shapes your preparedness and, and how can these positive uh, developments be sustained? So uh, I, I think the um, other colleagues have touched on this, and let me just reiterate and and support their comments. Uh, my colleague from Ghana and, and Nigeria, uh, that the, the first thing that I, I, I believe as a continent we have to do, and as public health experts, is to continue to raise this issue, take advantage of uh, the COVID-19 crisis and elevate this issue and maintain it at the levels of uh, the, the political leadership of the continent, the, the head of state. Um, this is the moment they are paying attention to this. They are paying attention closely to um, how COVID is uh, evolving. They recognize that it is not just a health issue, it's a, a, an economics issue, a serious economic issue as a continent. We are looking for $100 billion as a, an economic stimulus. It started off with $100 billion. Uh, in one year, it's now been shipped to 100 billion in, in three years. So I think I, st I insist on that because that is what is going to drive us as public health experts to continue to place this dialogue at the forefront uh, so that it receives the appropriate uh, political attention. Uh, public health is political. I mean, we've now learned in eight months of this crisis how politics influences a public health response across the board. I mean, the, uh, many uh, public health agencies across um, uh, 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 the world in leading countries have uh, uh, witnessed the severity of this. So on the continent of Africa, we need to position ourselves to um, to make sure that uh, the coordinating ability and cooperative ability that has been brought to bear to support this response is maintained and, uh, and, and continue to uh, use that to make for, ask for the demands that uh, my colleague uh, Kofi from uh, Ghana highlighted brilliantly. You don't build health systems when you need them. You build health systems before you need them. I think uh, that is uh, in excellence. And uh, we have to make it uh, very clear, uh, using all uh, avenues and all pathways to be sure that uh, uh, strengthening our public health systems is now henceforth forever be seen as an investment, not a cost. The significant uh, maths or uh, uh, analysis that clearly shows that the return on investment, if this is done right, and it has to be done right. I mean, the continent, as I indicated earlier, has to truly, deliberately be departing from the culture of dependency for uh, the North to come to the South and solve our problems. It, it would not happen. 
I think um, for the uh, 60 years of independence of our uh, nations, I can't point to one case where externalities have uh, transformed our health system. There, there's none uh, there. However, I'm very encouraged. COVID-19 has brought uh, us to the recognition that we have to manufacture locally. There are these five countries on the continent that started manufacturing diagnostics locally. And you wonder why were, why were we as a continent not doing this before? Right. I think there's diagnostic manufacturing now going on in, 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 uh, in Senegal, in Nigeria, in Morocco, in South Africa, wow. and uh, uh, more recently just last weekend in Ethiopia, where Ethiopia has just developed a, a state of the art uh, diagnostic manufacturing to supply over 30 million uh, COVID tests uh, uh, across the continent and also meet its own domestic needs. You wonder uh, where we were uh, since uh, 40 years, where we have been testing 100 million, uh, conducting 100 million HIV tests uh, a year for the past close to 35 years as a continent, but there's no country that produces one single rapid test for diagnosis for HIV. What a missed opportunity. Let's not miss the, another opportunity with the COVID-19 uh, 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 situation. We should always remind ourselves as a continent that because of our inability to uh, support and develop a strategic vision for our own health security as a continent, between 1996, when the, uh, the antiretroviral drugs were developed, and they started being available and accessible in the developed world, it would take us 10 years before they, they, they were available in Africa, right? So if you look at the mortality rate, the, uh, rates in, 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 in Europe and the United States, they plummeted in 1997 once ARVs were available. And it would take us up to 2002 to 2003 before ARVs were available and accessible in Africa because they costed $10,000 per treatment for, per year. And our mortality numbers um, uh, declined, started declining in 2005, about 10 years later. Guess how many Africans died because of that delay? 12 million Africans died because of that uh, uh, lack of access to drugs. So if history doesn't teach us a lesson, then we're bound to repeat history and continue to do that in, in going forward. I really feel strongly that Africa needs to uh, uh, really look itself in the mirror and call for a new public health order that addresses these areas that you are indicating. Thank you. Thank you, John. That, that's very powerful. I, I appreciate your comments a great deal. Um, Moji uh, reappeared and then she disappeared again. So uh, she's having, I believe, uh, connectivity issues. So, so Bill Dart, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to you and and hopefully uh, we'll we'll still get her back. Um, I, I wanted to ask you uh, when you when you're um, thinking about your work under COVID nineteen, ha has the pandemic led the Joint Medical Store to uh, initiate new ways of operating or working with? stakeholders in, in different ways that, that you see that would be valuable to continue after the crisis has passed? And, and just more generally, what opportunities do you see for the public and private supply chains sector to, to jointly prepare and, and collaborate in response to, to epidemics or other shocks? Uh, thank you once again. Um, I, in terms of the, different ways that we have worked under COVID. I did mention earlier issues of having arrangements that are flexible between ourselves and uh, the people who supply us, our suppliers, and also uh, the people that we supply all our customers, including government, including the private sector. And um, for me, what I see that we have learned and that we shall continue to work on is the issue of having um, business to business capabilities uh, both upstream and also downstream. Because by so doing, you make your life much more easier during a crisis. The key thing is that, as was mentioned, I think earlier, this cannot be done during the crisis. It means that we must all work around ensuring that we have uh, strengthened systems, strengthened partnerships that are, uh, are, are primed to be activated during the, the period of the crisis. And uh, for me, that brings me to the issue of the opportunities as I see them. 
And uh, I and I'm going to talk about the example of Uganda, which I know very well, uh, and many other low and medium income countries. We have a lot of projects that we run, uh, many of them supported by development partners, and many of these projects are are done in such a way that while the project subsists, it creates many times, not all the time, but many times, these projects create systems that make it easier and more convenient for the implementation of the project to happen. And in so doing, they either weaken or do not actually strengthen the system that you would require as a country. When the crisis hits like this crisis we are in now, these projects or those systems that were created by projects cannot actually support a response to a crisis or a pandemic. So I think for me, one of the crucial things that I see and an opportunity that we must uh, all embrace is actually to make sure that whatever project, whatever uh, program is set in place or is being implemented, it must work to strengthen the systems for that country the system for that country so that even after the project, even in a crisis, the systems can actually be able to, to, to respond. The second thing I think is, I think there's an opportunity, at this stage it has been realized an opportunity arises for us to establish in normal circumstances, assuming this crisis is over, to establish collaborative mechanisms uh, that can then be used during the crisis that as government and private sector, that within the private sector, that as regions, we should uh, set up um, collaborations, establish them when there's no crisis, that when the crisis comes, these can then be used to respond to a crisis. Thank you very much. That's that's great, Bildard. Thank you. I, I've, I've been monitoring the questions coming in from the audience, and there's one for you, Bill Dard, that I, even though we're we're going to go to uh, audience questions more generally in a few minutes, I wanted to to go ahead and ask it now because it's directly related to to what you were just talking about. We we had someone who asked a question for you. Did you make any specific changes to your supply chain systems because of COVID nineteen, or did you did you just use the existing systems as they were? And if you did make changes, could you tell us what they were? No, we actually did not make any specific changes or, or introduce new things. I think what happened is that we used our already existing systems, but used them more than we would would. For example, we, we, we already have um, an enterprise resource software that we use to um, run most of our operations. It also has a business to business dealing. In other words, we can be able to receive process and orders using that system. But much less of that was being used, much less of the, because uh, some of our customers would actually walk into the warehouse and make their orders and all the things. But now it was more difficult for them to do so. And therefore many of them were using the, the ERP more than they would deny the would. Great, thank, thank you. So uh, Moji, are you, are you back? Can you hear me and can we hear you? Okay, looks like still problem still. Uh, that's very unfortunate. Um, let me let me go uh, to to you, Rick. Uh, and I think this question uh, that I was going to ask you builds on on remarks that others have made already. But I was wondering, from your perspective as a consultant who's worked with countries around the world, can can you tell us what role governments can play in facilitating and sharing information um, so that that um, we can have stronger su su medical supply systems. And, and can you give any examples of how health systems have successfully incorporated risk management and analytics uh, during COVID-19 or, or in other cases? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and a couple of things that I want to reiterate that, that were said by, by my colleagues on the line here before, like the, John was talking about the platform and building a system before you actually need it. And I think Kofi, you, you mentioned something similar as well. Um, that is extremely important. Uh, 
as a as a government agency make sure that you have those platforms ready to go that you have the systems before an, a, a next pandemic actually hits um a builder uh, you you spoke about arrangements with suppliers uh, it's also extremely important to to have standards in place and arrangements with the suppliers before the crisis hits and me coming from the control tower way of looking at things it's all about information sharing and really the problem with information sharing in the pandemic has been that there's too much information and no one is sharing the same information on the same level of detail. It is as, as, as if you're speaking a different language. So what, what, I, what I believe is important from, from government agencies uh, uh, is to, to build a standard and to, to, to set a standard on how we communicate. What is the level of detail of information that we share in order to actually share a valuable set of information. Um, an example is where, where, where uh, in the ventilator case that we spoke about earlier, a lot of information was shared on a very aggregated level, uh, on uh, a state level uh, availability of ventilators. That is not sufficient. There is more detail needed for manufacturers and pharmaceutical suppliers, and also the suppliers of the suppliers to actually make decisions that direct, uh, directly impact the way you operate your supply chains. And an example where it actually, actually went well is, um, uh, is in, in, in South Africa, where the government agencies stood up to actually bring together uh, a, a whole broad set of information from quality to, to uh, availability of products to uh, test, uh, test kits in diagnostics information. It all came together in, in a single place in a standardized format. The problem with that is, however, that this is just one nation. The challenge is going to be, as long as we have a global model and global supply chains, which is always going to be hard to avoid despite what we spoke about earlier, we need to make sure that this, these sets of information are globally available, globally accessible, and we need to find the boundaries of what we are willing to share as the commercial and private sector with the uh, uh, the, the government agencies out there. And that to me is essential, is something that needs to be driven by the local regulatory bodies, the local government agencies, the nonprofit organizations, to set the standard for communication and the common language to start communicating. Great. Thank, thank you, Rick. Um, Kofi, I'm going to finish up this round of questions uh, with you. And, and I have kind of a a broad, almost a philosophical question for you. What, uh, I know those of us who work in supply chains are often very focused on, on stockouts and on you know, the availability of, of medical supplies when they're needed. But do you think the COVID-19 crisis is moving us to a place where we see supply chains as more of an integral part of the, of the entire health system and, and uh, that they should be managed uh, not just with a with a view toward toward avoiding stockouts. Could you talk about that a little bit? Thanks, Wade. From my perspective, probably not. I mean, this is a very important point to highlight. We really, really need to ask ourselves the question: why do we need effective supply chains in health? Do we need them because we want the product at a certain location at a certain point, or we want the product to do some work? I'll give you a typical example. We've been talking about new vaccines coming in. The global discourse is about how we will distribute the vaccines. Nobody has been talking about how do we avoid latency? How do we avoid adverse events? How do we track all those things? Nobody is talking about that. Every The focus of the discussion is around how do we distribute it so that everybody gets it. Yesterday, I was in some discussions with some students from Johns Hopkins. And I, I heard a phrase that said that vaccines are no vaccines without vaccination. For me, same story. Yes, you can have availability. Yes, you can have no stockouts. But if there are no services, if patients don't know how to take the medicines, doctors, prescribers, nurses, pharmacists do not know how to dispense. If there are no systems in place to ensure that if adverse events are being picked up, they are being uh, adequately communicated so that uh, system changes would happen. Then we really are not focusing on the pharmaceutical system. We are not focusing on why we need the product where it is. 
it's unfortunate that the focus on supply services, the focus on the product being there has really downplayed the need for pharmaceutical care services. I mean, if you go to any typical country in, in Africa, you ask yourself, what is the organization for this? There's a chief pharmacist or a directorate of pharmacy. There's the medical regulatory authority. There's the pharmacy council who is managing products, who is managing premises, who is managing the personnel. These things are typically so unorganized, typically not coordinated. And all these issues seem to work in silos. It relates to the finance, it relates to the trade in the organization. What collaborations, intra and inter countries, intra and inter organizations within the country. So supply chains needs to be strong, but if the regulatory environment is not there, if the systems that ensure that the products that the supply chain brings to the doorstep are used appropriately, then frankly, we would have an Amazon system, which works. Amazon brings the product to your doorstep and ring a bell and go away. We can't do that for medicines. We need to ensure that the patients know what to do. We need to ensure that what I call the meter beyond the last mile is an important consideration when we develop the last mile. The meter beyond the last mile is an important consideration when we develop the supply chains. Without ensuring that medicines are used appropriately, without ensuring that we are avoiding antimicrobial resistance, without ensuring that the focus is on why we need a supply chain, and we will continue to make the supply chain an end in itself, while from my perspective, the supply chain is an enabler of the pharmaceutical care that is needed to ensure that health care and health outcomes are attained. Thanks. Thanks, Kobe. Um, I, I'm afraid that, that uh, Moji is just unable to connect with us, which I'm, I'm very disappointed about for uh, both for reasons of her expertise as a regulator, but also as um, professional men in the field of development who care about gender issues, we're all supposed to take a pledge that we will not serve on panels that are entirely uh, filled by men. Uh, and we have unfortunately been forced into that position because of connectivity uh, issues from Nigeria. So we have a, a mantle here, which is which is not what we intended. Um, it, I think they're making a last ditch effort to have uh, have Moji call in on a, on a phone line. And if that works, we'll, we'll of course go to her. But um, let me uh, in, in the meantime, turn to the last poll and then we will go to uh, questions from the audience. So uh, Mackenzie, if we could put up the the last poll for for the audience before we go to audience Q and A. Okay, there it is on your screen. I'll, I'll read. It says the pandemic has revealed why strong pharmaceutical systems are critical to sustaining health goals. What's the biggest pressure point that it uncovered? A. The need to ensure appropriate use of medical products. B. Slow to adapt supply chains. C. Lack of national regulatory and quality assurance capabilities. D, gaps in data gathering or sharing. And E, need for management and health worker training. Which that last one is, is something we haven't touched on uh, too much during this conversation. I think it's an interesting point. So again, uh, we all know that the pandemic has um, uncovered uh, Challenges, particular challenges in the pharmaceutical supply chain. We're asking you for your views on um, which one is the biggest pressure point, the, the need to ensure appropriate use of medical products, slow to adapt supply chains, lack of national regulatory and quality assurance capabilities, gaps in data gathering or sharing, and finally, the need for management and health worker training. So if we can go, I want to leave time for as many questions as we can. So uh, Mackenzie, if we can go quickly to the to the responses. Uh, as in other questions, we have uh, people with views across the board. Looks like um, by a by a nose, uh, slow to adapt supply chains is identified as as the biggest challenge, but also of course lack of national regulatory and quality capability and gaps in data gathering. For sharing, so uh, highlights I think the the uh, issues and challenges across a whole range of uh, those supply chain and health system 
management issues. Um, all right, I am going to turn now to questions from the audience, and I warn you, panelists, that my my questions were uh, were easy, uh, and uh, some of these from the from the uh, audience are a little tougher. So you're going to have to be on your toes here. Um, let me ask, I think a very interesting and, and somewhat provocative question, but it's it's a good one and it's one that we should probably discuss. Uh, and John, I don't know whether you're you're the best uh, one to respond, but I but I'd appreciate the thoughts from any of you is how is Africa preparing to counteract the concept of vaccine nationalism by developed countries? John, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Can, can you hear me? Yes, can. Well, uh, the, the Africa is uh, trying to, uh, is working hard to secure vaccines for the continent and uh, working at the highest level of the continent. We, uh, the, the leadership of the continent, the Bureau of the Head of States have endorsed uh, on August 22nd, uh, an overarching uh, vaccine uh, strategy for the continent. And we are pursuing that. I mean, it's amazing you raised that because this uh, just, um, as we are on this call, we are finalizing a working group that will be discussing with the, the COVAX facility tomorrow at 8 p.m. Uh, on behalf of the continent as a mandate of, of, of the, the AU. So I think we are working on that. We are completely uh, supportive of the COVAX facility. We are not working to counter vaccine nationalism, but to ensure that there's global solidarity and cooperation, such that, I mean, we're re recognizing that COVID infection anywhere in the world remains a threat everywhere in the world, including Africa. There is no way that a continent of 1.5 uh, two billion people will be left behind and should be left behind in this uh, the search for vaccine and the timely access to vaccines. I did mention the case of the ARVs when they were available in 1996, the impact that it had on the continent because of the delays. We don't want history to repeat itself now, and we are making a very strong case. We are also looking, looking uh, besides the COVAX facility, looking inward and developing uh, uh, partnerships and financing mechanisms with uh, Afri Exim Bank. Uh, uh, discussions will soon start with um, the African Development Bank so that we can raise appropriate uh, resources to finance uh, vaccines for the continent to enable us to get to a 60% threshold. Uh, you, the, the, um, you've heard perhaps in the news that WHO is negotiating for 220 million doses of vaccines and we consider that to be a 20 percent but we as a continent are aspiring to vaccinate up to 60 percent of our population to ensure herd immunity and not just counting for donation but also counting on raising the money from our own development banks as a coalition there's a whole team that has been put together by president amaposa in his capacity as the chair of the african union to work on this thank you thank, thank you john it, it, uh, anyone else have uh, thoughts on that? Kofi, do you have anything you want to add? Um, just to add that, indeed, yes, the regional collaboration is key. I mean, John has kept saying that there is capacity in Africa, but how do we really harness that capacity to ensure that we are all working together to counter this issue? And I think that for as long as we can recognize that this capacity is there and we can uh, harness that capacity amongst ourselves and work together, understand each other. I believe that we can overcome this issue. Thanks. Great. Um, there, there are two questions that I'm looking at that are, I, I think, related. So I'm going to ask them both at the same time. Um, one, uh, they come from the observation that we've all made and discussed that there is going to need to be an increasing reliance on local production of, of things like PPEs and, and pharmaceuticals in, in Africa. And, and so two people have asked about the regulatory challenges uh, related to local production. Well, one question is, are African regulatory authorities going to be able to deal with the challenges of local production? And another person has asked, about quality control and how can 
uh, African countries ensure uh, quality and safety of uh, pharmaceuticals that are produced locally. So I don't know, uh, Moji, of course, would be uh, ideally uh, positioned to, to speak to that. Um, Bill Dard, uh, maybe you have thoughts and, and also John again. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, one day I would be happy to uh, just um, share my thoughts on that issue. Uh, first of all, I think and believe strongly that um, there's no way we are going to replace the need to have local production of some of these essential commodities in the country, in our countries. In, in, in Uganda, I saw a number of um, farms start production of masks, start production of a number of products, and therefore that would go in a, a long way to supporting our countries to respond to prices that happen in the country when the, the, the supply, the international supply chain mechanism is. Uh, is disrupted and maybe in the long term to build our own sustainability to, to use those commodities. But of course, the issue of quality is very crucial. And for me, I fail to, to get it if we say that we are right now managing to uh, do quality control on products that we are importing from outside the country, including traveling thousands of miles to do GMP audits in Europe, in China, in India. And then we are worried that we cannot be able to do the same when those commodities are produced in Africa. I know that in many places, maybe the regulatory agencies are not as strong as they could be, but I think what is needed is building capacity of the regulatory agencies. One, number two is making sure that when we set the rules, we actually follow them. And I think if we do that, there shouldn't be any problem. Because indeed, in most of, in many African countries, they are, there's local production of pharmaceuticals. And the quality of those pharmaceuticals is actually co comparable to, to the quality of the pharmaceuticals elsewhere. The only problem is if we don't play by the rules, and that's where I think the main focus needs to be. Thank you. Uh, wait, I mean, want to weigh in here, coffee here. <laughs> This is a very tough question, I must say. Yes, local production, from my perspective, is very key to build the local capacity, uh, to build the local economy, and to supplement, especially when what we saw happen when COVID started with uh, blocking of borders and uh, uh, blocking of API movements, et cetera, happened. So yes, for countries needs to do that. But the underlying systems is ensuring that the regulatory systems work. And we cannot focus on local capacity or local production without focusing on building the capacity of regulatory authorities, not just within the countries that are producing, but within the sub-region and relying on each other, ensuring that we are using the capacities that are around us to do it, not building everything uh, ourselves, but relying on each other, harmonizing uh, all these issues. If the regulatory authority is not working as it should, then the confidence in the product, the confidence in the uh, in the healthcare system is eroding. Okay, so and if you can trust the regulatory authority uh, to be able to guarantee the quality, to be able to guarantee the safety, then yes. I mean, there was a paper, uh, a commentary that came out recently from Tamara and, 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 and Guzman that talked about the fact that if we do not, if we don't make long-term investments in regulatory capacity, in regulatory systems, we're going nowhere with the pharmaceutical system. So, Yes, local production is critical, it's important, it is necessary, but it needs to be uh, accompanied by ensuring that the regulatory authorities that assure us the quality, that assure us the systems are also strengthened alongside. Thank you. Thanks, Kobe. Um, uh, I wanna ask the organizers of the webinar, um, I see Moji has reappeared. Yes, can you hear me, wait? Yes, absolutely, Moji, welcome. Finally. <laughs> yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Yes. Uh, the immediate question was, um, if, if Africa is going to rely more on locally produced pharmaceuticals, what uh, can the regulatory authorities do to ensure quality? Yes, I agree completely with Kwame that without strong regulatory system, uh, the manufacturing industry will not survive. And from NABDAC's uh, perspective, uh, we are 
very we are getting string you know using stringent measures with our local manufacturing companies uh using who unido uh indices uh to know whether our manufacturing companies are compliant or not and we did a 165 company inspection uh over six months and we categorize actually our companies into three low medium and high risk categories and the goal is to make sure to enable them to know how they're going to go, come go from high risk uh to medium risk and medium risk to low risk so we i agree with kwame that uh regulatory authority that is not strong cannot uh have an industry that is strong and uh, we are going through navdac is going through global benchmarking and we are getting stronger every day uh, but in terms of the impact of local manufacturing uh post covid it's not now nigeria doesn't have a choice uh because we were stung we were stung very badly at uh, the beginning of covid because you know in india shot his doors you know and uh, we now learn that we are too over dependent we're still going to be dependent you know to some extent right now we manufacture we we manufacture only 30 percent of our of our products locally and import 70 percent the goal is to change it around to like 60 uh locally and 40 percent import so uh that is going to really uh contribute positively uh first of all to reducing substandard falsified medicines and of course improve the health of uh, the population over thank you that's that's great moji i i'm so glad you were able to to join us we we have um, not even 10 minutes left but i wanted to to go back to you now that we can hear you so clearly and ask you at least uh, two of the questions that i was going to ask you earlier and one of them is i'll just just simply if you could outline for us some of the challenges that you have faced since covid uh, in nigeria and your regulatory capacity and then if you could also talk about the role of regulators in in the rolling out of of, uh, of an eventual vaccine about uh, covid 19. yes uh, some of the challenges uh, include uh, the onslaught of applications for COVID commodities and uh, not even having guidelines uh, for such before COVID. So we have to do things at a hundred miles per hour type of speed. Uh, we use reliance uh, in terms of, uh, you know, evaluating many of these uh, commodities and that was actually worked well for us. And we also use expedited approval uh, a process that takes about 120 days uh, started taking 10 to two weeks 10 days to two weeks uh we've also faced challenge of uh, herbal medicine uh on specified claims or uh, on proven claims uh for cure of covid and whatnot so we have to also contend uh with with that and again the manufacturing companies in nigeria uh was in shock because they couldn't get their products, uh, their raw materials in, or even finished products. So we have to uh, then start, you know, being the broker between the government and uh, the manufacturing companies, because Nigerian government realized that they've neglected the health sector for too long. So the government is now paying attention to local manufacturing, and NAPDAC was the broker in terms of how much should a company get to do the infrastructure and so on. So those are the types of challenges that we we face, but we were able to use reliance. And also there were unscrupulous um, importers that were bringing in so many uh, COVID commodities that we also have to contend with. And of course, we have to know how to keep ourselves safe, our environment uh, safe. That is another challenge. In terms of uh, the rollout of vaccines, uh, NAVDAC has been participatory in different uh, forum, uh, WHO, uh, ICMRA, Global Steering Committee in, in preparation for the rollout of a uh, uh, vaccine. And uh, NAVDAC is privileged to be one of the two African countries that will 
uh, that have been chosen to be part of the rollout of vaccines using track and trace. And uh, NAVDAC is already uh, or already has a traceability desk, and that is going to work out well now. We started that about a year plus ago, uh, so it will help with this rollout of vaccines. And in terms of our own role as a as an organization or regulatory agency, of course, you know we're going to do the licensing. We've been meeting actually uh, with a, a few vaccine manufacturers. They want to know what are our requirements, things like that. So we're going to be doing the licensing. But with that also, we have to be very, very careful to make sure that the data they are bringing is very robust, is GMP, clinical evaluation, uh, platform for pharmacovigilance, things like that. So we are ready in terms of uh, uh, vaccines coming in. Uh, and uh, we just hope that you know once they come in, we'll, <laughs> we'll be 100% ready. But uh, that is just uh, our role to make sure that whatever is coming in uh, is of quality, is safe, and it has efficacy. And of course, we're going to follow up when the vaccines start coming in. Immunization, we have to follow up on the clinical outcomes. Uh, Hopefully, there will not be COVID uh, or vaccination enhanced respiratory disease. We are hoping that that will not be happening. Thank you so much. Over. Thank you, Moji. It's so great to have your voice uh, uh, joining with us on the panel. So we have a uh, we have less than five minutes. I, I was going to. It's been a, such a rich discussion. I was going to turn back to each of you just to make kind of 30 seconds worth of concluding remarks and and two questions that we didn't get to that I if if any of you could address as you wrap up I think would be uh, um, interesting one, one person asked about capacity building in Africa and what you know what more can be done to build capacity to manage supply chains and another person asked about financing and the you know the enormous costs of preparing uh, uh, for uh, strengthening health systems uh, before the next crisis comes. So, with those two uh, potential ideas in mind to wrap up with, uh, I'll turn to you, uh, John, just for thirty seconds or so. Uh, thank you so much again for this wonderful um, webinar. I think my concluding uh, uh, remarks will be that let's truly focus on the known do nothing gaps in health systems. We've known that these gaps existed for long. Uh, we've talked about health security uh, uh, more than we've actually uh, uh, invested in it. So let's focus now deliberately to strengthening those systems. Thank you. Great. Um, Bill Darden. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, my uh, departing shots would be that I think for me, the key thing that we have to focus on should be number one, as, as was already said about ensuring that we build systems prior to the crisis. Number two, that we remain adaptable, that we have systems that can be adapted to fit into a normal situation and also into a crisis. And lastly, that we should use every chance that is available to us to prepare. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, Rick. Yeah, thank you as well um, uh, for, for this great event. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with, with what was uh, said before. Um, uh, on top of that, I would absolutely uh, recommend to focus on the standardization of how we communicate uh, information sharing. And I believe that that also uh, will add to the last discussion topic that we just spoke about when it comes to quality. Quality is an exception in itself and also needs communication and information sharing in the right way. Thanks again. That's great, Rick. Thank you. Kofi, and I'll leave Moji for the final word. Thanks, uh, everybody. I think that I'll refer us to two documents that came out recently. One was a commentary on integrating pharmaceutical systems that concluded that the focus on the short-term efficiency is not good for us. So we should be looking at the long-term strengthening, the long-term strengthening of the system, and also to shift from the narrow focus as medicines as an input commodity, but the more comprehensive view of the various structures and processes that are needed. And also the FIP policy statement that came out today uh, talking about in the, uh, the, for the, the role of pharmacy in promoting patient safety. We need to ensure that medication without harm becomes the, 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 the mantra for all of us. Yes, it is needed. We need the products now, but let's not bring products that will cause harm. 
avoiding medication errors, avoiding medication errors, avoid, especially for high risk products is key. And lastly, supply chains are great. We need to have the products, regulatory systems and governance systems are key and information around all these things are critical. Thank you. Thanks, Kofi. So, um, Moji, uh, bring us home, and then uh, and then I'll I'll let uh, Marion uh, close us out. Any final thoughts, Moji? Okay, um, uh, Marian. Thank you very much. Yeah, Marian can go ahead. Okay, <laughs> Moji, I'm so sorry. <laughs> My goodness, it is it is coming to the end of our a lot of time, um, and I did want to uh, thank you know there's there's various. Uh, the presenters have been stimulating. I kept wanting to jump in and change a mantle to add a female voice because there's just been so much information, interesting information um, here. Um, but in particular, I wanted to take a minute to thank you, Wade, uh, for doing a very nice job of, of moderating. And there are lots of individuals who make events like this happen. Um, it may feel easier in some ways that this is all online, but in many ways it's harder. And so I just want to give the entire team kudos for a job well done um, and we have plenty more to do in terms of strengthening supply chains it's so incredibly important for delivering medicines for all but i think we're on our way with a group like this how can we not succeed so have a blessed evening day afternoon wherever you are bye-bye thank you all it was my pleasure bye